Hi, ever wonder what it's like to work another profession or live in the underworld? Listen to Unsuspecting Riders give a 10 to 15 minute personal masterclass as I spontaneously interview them as they enter my taxi. I'm your host, Simon Rushton, and this is Taxi Chronicles. Morning, morning, morning. Yes, we're back with another rider, another day. Today we've got an interesting guy. He's a, I'm not sure if you should say a, a the British version of Steven Spielberg and things. But anyway, here, here he is. He makes movies. He makes movies and does adverts and much more. So nice to have you here today. Hi, I'm Ben. Um, as I said briefly, I work in film and PR, have done for years in London, but yeah. Okay, so tell us, Ben, how did you get into the industry and what motivates you? Um, yeah, what well, got me in the industry? I think in my side of film is, is cameras and lighting, so cinematography. Um, and since I was a kid, I was really into cameras, just fiddling with them, always trying to get hold of my dad's video camera. Like the family tape thing, uh, made lots of, I wish I could dig them up, awful videos <laughs> when I was a kid, um, but it's something I always just did to like mess around with with friends, and yeah, following that, I think it's, I went to, I grew up in the Midlands, in Wolverhampton, mm-hmm. um, and there was a, a Catholic school I went to, so it was very like, proper lessons, proper education, mm-hmm. um, and it was around the time that you could go to college, I found I could do, like the idea of college, I didn't even think that was a thing. Um, but looked it up, found I could like study film and media, which opened up this whole world of like, oh wow, I can actually learn more about this and work in it. Um, which that kind of started me off. So I did two years in a college studying film, like film theory, media, and that was great. That was, um, not too many of the major academic subjects were like my strong points apart from like the old science but went to film school and just flew through it like it all made sense to me um so this was your calling then i guess so yeah and the fact that i'm still in it probably says that it it would be my calling but um yeah it was that then obviously you topped straight to uni did film at uni for three years and that's kind of when I focused in on the the aspect of cinematography so like really like cameras and lighting is what I want to be working with um then I moved to London in 2014 that's your master's degree in cinematography it's a film school around Ealing um which yeah I was taught by people that worked on Indiana Jones like what was Spielberg uh Hellraiser all these crazy big films I knew of, like I was being taught by people that have worked on those. Okay. Um, so it was a big jump to like, oh shit, here's, here's the, the big players uh, in the field. Um, I suppose you must have really immersed yourself there. Yeah, that was just a big... Yeah, you were just virtually living the life of work, work, work. Just yeah. Everything was learning so, like a sponge. Yeah. Smoking, um, soaking in as much as possible. And we were within Ealing Studios, so lots of history there. There's still productions happening next to us. So yeah, to say you're in it and a sponge is very accurate because there's actual productions literally being shot next door to you. Um, and our tutor would take us to Pinewood Studios a lot. We went onto the set of, I say the set of, we went next when they were filming one of the newer Star Wars films. So we have definitely a big jump into, wow, I'm kind of seeing this for real. Um, but no, it's great. So it's, it's been a really good journey, like studying and learning that. And thankfully, I still work in it to some regard. Mm-hmm. Okay. So tell me, what would you what would you say you've learned that you wish you knew when you would started? Um. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I think when I started I wish I kind of had this idea I think it's just that that click of great I can learn this and then study it and then work in it um 
isn't quite as easy as you want it to be. Um, obviously, it's a very hard industry. And, like, obviously, I came straight out of film school, kind of, like, really just expecting that you're going to work somewhere. Obviously, it doesn't quite work like that. And I kind of wish, when I was studying, it's more about just the experience of the learning and, like, I'm setting myself up for this at some point, rather than, like, I'm doing this because I need to get a job. Um, so I definitely wish I spent a bit more time just, like, enjoying the experience and, like, the connections being made, rather than just trying to focus on, like, how do I live off this? Because that's obviously something I would worry about now. But, yeah, I wish I had that a little less during the studying phase. Mm, I understand that. Mm -hmm. What skills would you say if someone was coming into the industry that they should need to know? What you, You've told us our part, your path. Yeah. Is there anything you would change on your path and what skills that someone needs to make sure that they have? Um, I think having an idea of like which area you want to work within can like change your path quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so as I said, where I've ended up with the cinematography, it's I'll be the head of a department. So you kind of need to have some good managerial skills because mm -hmm. you're literally managing a crew of about what, 15, 20 people. Oh, so you need, lot, it? it can be a fair lot. There's lots of moving parts. Uh, and this is just lighting. Lighting and camera. So you have about like oh, three camera. three people on the camera, plus we have an operator. Um, then you're lighting, you have gaffer, sparks, there's the grip. Three people on one camera? Uh, two. So two people, really? Yeah, so well, it's on the camera, there's one, but camera assistant. So you have the people that do all the setup of the cameras, do all the tape markings, uh, mark the, the slates off, which is when they do the clapperboard. Uh, yeah. Second AC is take one, take yeah. two, that thing. Yeah. Uh, they're in charge of like which lenses, getting the lenses swapped out. Uh, and so then they'll have a second camera assistant which kind of works for them. So there's kind of this whole hierarchy system of you do like a very specific thing and you have someone else facilitate making that easier yeah. for you. And that's across all fields really so in film. You understand the overall, yeah. like a site, I uh, use a site manager for us. Yeah. Kind of works like that, yeah. And then you put the trades underneath who they're specialists. Yeah. And you've just got to have an understanding. They've got to be able to share your vision. Of, because what brings to mind now is that you spoke about cameras mm -hmm. and the lens. Do they decide what lens are you going to be used? The cameraman himself, or is it the director, or is it? So that'd be yeah, that the, yeah, the role I play is the director of photography. So you'd work that out with with the director. Yeah. It can vary quite a lot. Some directors know exactly what they want to shoot with, and it's like we'll shoot this on a fifty mil lens, um, and that's what we do. Or some kind of like are a bit more like, what do you think, mm -hmm. and they open it up a bit, but. Yeah, it's a bit, obviously it's a collaborative decision, but it's it varies from set to set. But this definitely comes from director, me, mm -hmm. um, over a camera operator sometimes. So how do you decide, let's say, let's say the choice is yours, you've got a typical set, I don't know what a typical set would be. Yeah. How would you decide what lens to use? Um, I think that depends on what the scene's about because different lenses can give different feelings. Um, there's the whole, if the, the smaller the number, the wider the lens, so. Oh, it's smaller the number of people? I uh, know, like an 18 mil, you see, it's a yeah. wider field of view than like a 50 mil. Okay. Um, but obviously, there's all sorts of things of like, if you shot on a wide lens, so obviously 18 something mil, 20 mil, yeah. but if you're filming that, up close to someone, it kind of, uh, I'll take a step back a little bit, like lenses, like obviously different lenses change how certain things can look, um, quite subtly, so you could have someone, like someone's head in the frame, yeah. uh, like a close up, but say if you are on a, a portrait lens, that would look a one way. If you want a wide lens and you're really close to them, mm -hmm. they'd look slightly warped and look kind of... Have you ever seen, gone to uh, the movies and thought, this was just shot wrong? Because, Oof. I'll give you an example. When I saw Gladiator, I love that movie. Oh uh, yeah, Russell, the uh, Russell, yeah. yeah. But the fight scenes is like you're too close. Yeah. 
you can't really see what's going on. Now, I think it, either they did that, so they wanted it to be a PG. Yeah. Or someone just said, ah, bollocks, and just... <laughs> I'm not yeah. going over to get the other lens, I'm just using this one. Kind yeah, of thing. It's, fight scenes are always a weird one. Um, I can't think of any films off the top of my head that I think were shot bad. Um, but then I look at Troy, Yeah. see what kind of person I am. <laughs> <for these films. laughs> And um, when uh, Brad Pitt did his thing where he fights that big guy, the Goliath guy, and mm-hmm. like, he comes running in and does the ducks and does the move with the sword and stabs him in his shoulder, kind of. That was, to me, that was shot perfectly. I saw everything. I saw the, it's like, you know, they, it's like you clip from one camera to another. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm not trying to speak like I'm an expert. I'm just, no, no, <laughs> yeah, just yeah, just cutting around it. But you can see how he's running it when he started to run and then the man threw his shield, the spear, and then he moved and da, da, da. And then it's like, you can see the different camera action to the actual final slaying scene. And then just him walking off, mm-hmm. like he, you know, he's like he just had breakfast, yeah, kind of thing. And I, I thought that, yeah, that was sweet. But I've seen other films where it's just like that gladiator. It's like I was thinking, maybe I'm sitting in the wrong place in the cinema. Maybe I'm too <laughs> close to the screen. Maybe you know, but I don't know. No, it's definitely lots of films uh, kind of do that sort of thing. I think some of something that people are a lot more aware of now. It's like action. If you shot it like that and you can't see what's going on, mm. it's just not enjoyable to watch. Because, mm. yeah, you're kind of... It takes you out of the film a bit and you start wondering why you can't see things. Yeah. Um, whereas films that have taken that approach of, like you said, Troy, where you can actually see things... You know who... Um, Michael Bay. Mm-hmm. I like his... Yeah, I know he's always... He's typical Hollywood. <laughs> with yeah. the glamour and the... The, the and poster the boy part. <laughs> yeah, everything. Yeah, poster boy, but sexy girl you need to be rescued that kind of thing but his he's always got kind of angle shots coming down face up no yeah down his, up his big hero shots the yeah, big, yeah 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 oh, that's what you call it yeah big hero it's like everything grand yeah it's like look at this person look what they just done uh, top of the world but i yeah. like it it sells to me that sells it's that it's, gets you excited it's like i love hollywood <laughs> yeah it's very like he's got He's good at what he does. Like they're very like known to be like, oh, it's another Michael Bay. Yeah. It's a big action thing. But I mean, he's good at he's good at doing that. <laughs> Wasn't it them who did the Game of Thrones last season? It was somebody from. Oh, I don't, I'm crowd. not too sure. I don't okay. think it was anyone of that caliber on Game of Thrones. I did. I should. Okay. No, because it was messed up, and I remember they're, they're saying that they usually do stuff from Michael Bay, or they are Michael Bay, one of the two. I can't, mm. I can't remember how it went. So, moving on to lighting. Yeah. Explain, obviously, you've got dark scenes, nighttime scenes, you've got, um, we could talk about Game of Thrones again with the, <laughs> with the dark scene. The dark scene. <laughs> yeah. No one can say, what's going on? Did he kill him? I don't know. Yeah, that was a, a bit too crazy, that episode. <laughs> What are they doing? Trying to push the envelope to see what they can get away with? Or... I think potentially. It's a tricky one when it's like broadcast because everyone's TV's different. And I think there was a slight push to try and get that sorted at some point. It was like, I think when one of the Stranger Things series came out, um, the directors kind of put a message from Netflix being like, please make sure your TV isn't set to this weird, like, automatic thing. Um, the customer's not interested in that. The customer's... Don't... No, they just want to get a TV and turn it on and yeah, watch stuff. Yeah, they, they have um, time for that. So it, was... that's... You get quite constrained in that bit because, yeah, if you want to shoot something that's... Which I guess they were going for in Game of Thrones, which is, like, just above pitch black, um, you kind of have to have your TV at the right settings because if you've got the contrast too up, you ain't seeing anything. <laughs> mm. okay. So... You know, there's a film with werewolves and vampires. Um, it's Underworld. It's Underworld's one of them, yeah. That's all dark. Yeah. But you can see what's going on throughout. Yeah. yeah. So how come? You know what I mean, how come other people struggle and other people don't? That's what I'm coming to, really. Yeah, I think with Underworld, like you can set the whole tone and like it's going to be dark film. So it's obviously with that, like the set and all the art direction. It's all known it's going to be dark. I think, I don't know if Game of Thrones, I can't remember what they said following that sheet, but I don't know if that was then kind of go, trying to go too realistic, as in it's literally just some torches. Oh, what you see, oh, I see what you mean. Um, 
to kind of not obviously Underworld would it's dark but it would have still been properly lit on a studio I suppose with Underworld they always act like they have the full moonlight yeah now on the film moonlight is clear yeah it's kind of night but clear Mm -hmm. yeah I suppose yeah yeah, big bright moonlight you have to take a take a lot into consideration which is harder for you the the camera side or the lighting side um which one's harder I think yeah the lighting can be more challenging but I, I enjoy it more so it's harder but it's like I enjoy doing it more for sure um uh, what did you start off learning first the lighting or the it was, it was cameras. cameras um they can obviously kind of go hand in hand but it's um cameras I definitely love the more tech side of them like the technology behind them how they work um just using them I love that side of things so uh, some of their cameras are really expensive, like fifteen grand or something. Uh, a lot more than that, up to like forty grand. Um, lenses are about twenty thousand each. Some of them. Uh, it's very big money. Um, but then saying that, Steven, did you hear about when Steven Spielberg filmed a movie on his iPhone? Did you hear about that one? No, I've it's seen the odd thing shot on an iPhone. It's. He did, uh? I've seen the odd, uh, there's a film Tangerine that was shot all on an iPhone as well. Okay, yeah, someone said, but he did it just to prove that he can do it. That yeah. the film can be done. So I was thinking, how do you see that those all those big lenses have become obsolete eventually? And I also, we... you've got drones, sorry for cutting you. No, no, it's cool. It's No, d- drones have been a, a great part of uh, getting aerial shots on the cheap. Um, I, don't, I don't think any of it will take over what's existing I think there's enough people that will always want the best most insane call that you could ever get and I think the proper dedicated cameras will always have an edge over phones because phone cameras are get better every time they put anyone out but it's still its main purpose is that it's a phone it's not and if it goes too far into the fact it's a camera it's obviously probably not going to be a very good phone Um, I think and you, when you've got the drones and you've got their camera boards assume get better and better depending on the weight yeah I heard that one of the bombs was filmed there's an action scene when they're fighting on the train mm-hmm. and uh, he gets shot by the by the other bombed agent woman by accident oh that it's Skyfall all, yeah yeah Skyfall that was all drone going along the yeah drones have in. a oh. you can get this like the consumer drones which are, they are very good and I've used them quite a lot. Um, it's like the DJI ones, which aren't that expensive in the grand scheme of camera equipment. Um, but they look great. But yeah, I think you get a lot more leeway with image quality when it's a big wide of like a landscape because- Oh, it's taken in a lot. It's like an SLR camera. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more of a spectacle that it looks just like, wow. Whereas like a phone camera filming a person, it kind of does look different to mm. your cinema camera. Um, so will a drone camera does that act like a phone camera or like a normal it grip de- camera it depends I've used ones which are kind of like a phone you can just troll it on your with an app but there's also drones which are basically like quadcopters that they can strap a cinema camera to because cinema cameras yeah they're like 40 grand and obviously That's like really the high end red cool. ones but they're quite small now but they're um, small okay some of them, there's like two major brands of Ari and Red. Um, yeah, I've heard of Red. Yeah, Red were like, their camera's like a small box. Um, How much, yeah. what's the weight? You know, then... Don't know, it's off my head. Um, Reds are quite small and light. Um, and they all, you can customise the hell out of them, make them out of carbon fibre and stuff. So there's all stuff to make them very small and don't weigh anything at all. Okay. Um, Ari were a bit behind on that. They were like the main leader, but their cameras are like built like tanks. Um, not very, not very easy to strap like a giant metal solid thing mm. to like a drone. But now they've got ones as well, which are quite small. So I think they've all gone the route of mm. make them a bit more tiny, and then you can actually get a lot more out of them. Yeah. You can just you can put your main camera on a drone because it's just like a little quadcopter thing. Um, so then you get you're getting the quality and I suppose what those companies, Red and the Arrow, want to do is 
team up with a popular drone company and make their own yeah have their own limited edition kind of thing yeah aimed at you guys I think if if anyone was going to do that probably Red Red, Red made a phone once I don't, I don't know what happened with that though that was their we're going to do big camera company makes like a phone and it looked crazy that's where it's like that the phone camera divide it was like a phone but the entire back was mm. this giant like camera thing on the it just wasn't a very good phone mm. I think I don't know what the camera quality was like but yeah it'd be quite interesting to see what comes out in the whole drone front mm -hmm. I understand yeah. All right. so what's the future hold for you then future yeah. um I said now i with my film dreams and all my hopes and hopes and dreams again for a Hollywood life. I, I work in a PR agency now, so it's uh Okay. Not not shooting much in the film regard. I'm shooting a lot more commercial, which I'm still enjoying. I'm still doing what I love, but it's kind of obviously a different audience. Mm -hmm. But I think um I'm I'm only twenty eight. I have the rest of my life ahead of me, so I'm hoping that down the line the path towards the film opens back up again um, mm -hmm. but for now I'm quite happy in the job I have it's been very mm. stable I, as I said I still get to f use cameras light just things which aren't filmed but one day I think I'll, I'll get back there you sound like you've done a lot for your age anyway yeah so it's yeah, been a jam packed yeah. uh, just education and then I've been working freelance for is what? that is that common in the industry or or are your mates envious of you or your college or your uni? The amount of that, um, no, I think it's just I think from like my friend is like a, everyone's known I've had like a good drive for like I want to work in film mm -hmm. and I've had a good clear trajectory of like mm, how you plan to it's do it. Been known since I was like a kid and mm -hmm. I'm still good friends with um one of my good friends that um a guy called Scott mm -hmm. um. I've known him since well, I was like 13, 14 I think but even then that was like a, us making stupid films and it's mm. kind of like he's obviously seen me go to where I'm at now and it's mm. I'm still on that path you, um, you said your films that you've made what kind of films have you made? Uh, I've made a lot of what have I made? I make a lot I've done a lot of short films I've done um, a lot of them have won lots of awards like Cannes Film Festival kind of thing I've, I've had ones that go to the Cannes Short Corner which is like the, the mini can that just mm -hmm. it rolls off like tons of short films in the corner um, I've had things there I've had things like what are they about normally do you have a theme um, no as I said with me being in the camera lighting department there's not really there hasn't really been like a a general thing I'm going for. I've done a lot of films that are about um, like social issues, like homelessness. Um, what else have I done? Like mental health. Um, just like films that focus on like single characters, like going through some tra traumatic event or just like dealing with things. Um, so yeah, I guess I have gravitated towards a lot of films which are about someone's journey through something. And it's like very personal films. Um, I think you get quite a lot out of them, and they're nice to work with. What's the impact you want to have on the world? Oof, big question. <laughs> um, the impact. Yeah, I guess. I, I guess I just like to make make films, which like I don't know, take people on journeys when they watch them, and have these emotions that you get when you watch films I don't know I just really like making stuff like that and hearing how people receive them obviously positive ones <laughs> there's always negative comments but uh, yeah, I it's uh no, it's, it's really happy when when you make something and you see it come together and then it's viewed and people say like great things about it and like how they felt mm -hmm. and I said some of the films we've made um about issues like homelessness and you hear how it's how people that have been near there or been near the circumstances we're filming about mm -hmm. like how that really touched them um so yeah i don't i don't think i have like a big i want to do x on the world it's just a 
small impacts of just like I don't know making yeah. people yeah. enjoy what they're watching yeah, feel things what works for you mm. okay well thanks a lot for that it thank you a, very much it was a great interview and if anybody wants to find you assuming you want people to find you where yep. can they find you ah uh, well I've got lots my website is bencalloway.card.co um, do you want to spell that yeah it's a B E N C A L L O W A Y dot C A L R D O dot co. It's because I can't afford a dot com account. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, this my name is what I use for most of my uh, social media things, which is why I post films I'm working on, stuff like that. Okay then. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, We hope you liked that interview. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to get the latest daily episode. Ever considered investing in a continent with the fastest growing economy and population on Earth? The same continent that holds 30% of the world's known natural resources? Then listen to our sister podcast, Africa Investor Stories, where you will hear real investors with real stories from around the world Share the experience of investing in Africa. We post Monday and Thursday at 10am.